Ok, buonasera a tutti, benvenuti al primo Game Talk della stagione. Uh, siamo felicissimi di avere Jay Keller con noi e tutto il, tutto il gruppo di Cargo Computer, perché c'è anche Thomas Kemensky e Ben Babbitt, che arrivano da diverse parti degli Stati Uniti, uh, qui a Kentucky, altri da Los Angeles, eccetera. E, um, a introdurre il Game Talk che uh, cominciano quest'anno alla fine di febbraio proseguiranno fino alla fine di giugno praticamente con nuovi invitati che vengono da uh, diverse parti del mondo per raccontare l'arte, la cultura, la presenza dei più giochi. Invito uh, Alessandro e Riccardo che uh, introdurranno gli ospiti di oggi. Thank you, Ricardo. Hi, everyone. Jay Kenya. He is the co-founder of Cardboard Computer. He is the writer, the designer, and the programmer of Kentucky Road Zero. He is to, has taught uh, the uh, video game design, programming, and experimental animation and uh, the uh, uh, School of Art Institute of Chicago, uh, Northwestern University, and Nippon University. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jake Elliott. for coming out to the talk, and um, thanks to IULM and Teo and everyone at the program for inviting us. Um, so yeah, my name is Jake, and I'm a uh, co-founder of the Ultralight Game Studio Hardware Computer. Uh, and the whole company is here, so yes, yeah, as, as mentioned, it's myself and Tomas Kamensi and Ben Babbitt, uh, who's over there. Uh, and we're here in Milan to teach in the Game Design Master's Program at IULM, so as a teacher, I'll be assigning some homework as part of this talk. <laughs> um, and the game that Tomas and Ben and I have been working on uh, is called Kentucky Route Zero. It's a magical realist adventure game in five acts about a secret highway that runs through the caves beneath Kentucky. Uh, this cave system, huge cave system underneath Kentucky called Mammoth Cave. We've been working on it for about 10,000 years or so. <laughs> um, and Mammoth Cave was a very different place 10,000 years ago. For example, this guy was doing a lot better about 10,000 years ago. This is the Kentucky Cave Shrimp, a blind albino shrimp who um, lives in the underground rivers and lakes in Mammoth Cave. Now they're an endangered species because of uh, human-produced poisons seeping through groundwater into their subterranean habitat. You can actually eat one of these in our game, but you shouldn't because there are only a few thousand of them still alive. There's evidence of human activity in Mammoth Cave going back about 6,000 years. Uh, the first people in America sought shelter there, they mined resources there, they buried their dead there. During the American Civil War, Mammoth Cave was an important source of potassium nitrate, which is used to make gunpowder, and comes from uh, bat poop, basically. In 1972, a cave explorer, a spelunker, named Pat Crowther, mapped out a new tunnel in Mammoth Cave, which connected it to another huge cave system in the United States called the Flint Ridge Cave System. Uh, mapping this new connection made Mammoth Cave the longest known cave in the world. So the current figure, as we understand it, is it's about 400 miles long. Pat Crowther was, at the time, married to a computer programmer named Will Crowther. And together they took all the data from Pat's expedition through the caves 
uh, and plotted some models of Mammoth Cave on the computer. A few years later, they had divorced, and as the story goes, Will Crowther was looking for a way to sort of connect with his daughters when he was visiting them because they were separated. Uh, and so he built a video game based partly on the data that Pat Crowther had harvested from her expedition in the caves, and also based partly on the Dungeons and Dragons games that Will was playing with his friends at the time. That game was called Colossal Cave Adventure, usually just shortened to Adventure. And it's where we get the name Adventure Game to describe Zork, The Secret of Monkey Island, Mist, The Walking Dead, eventually Kentucky Route Zero. Colossal Cave Adventure is the first game in that genre. This is what it looked like. So here's a scene from Colossal Cave Adventure that we can play together. Uh, so we're in Mammoth Cave now. We found ourselves lost in a maze of twisted little passages, all different. Uh, people navigate caves using maps and notes, compass. So uh, which compass direction should we go? Remember, there's eight directions on the compass. North. North, OK, let's go north. OK. Now we're in a little maze of twisting passages, all different. Which way should we go? East. East, OK, good. Uh, yeah, we're a little bit lost. We're running out of lamp fuel. We better make one last try. Any southwest. Southwest. Okay. Oh. <laughs> That's a shame that was wrong too. Um, by now, maybe you have a sense of what's going on in that maze. You can start to draw a map of the maze by paying attention to the different ways that the sentence is rephrased. Remember the maze of twisting little passages, the little maze of twisting passages, the maze of twisty little passages, and so on. Um, this picture here is somebody attempting to map it out. This is incomplete. There's you know eight different ways you can, or uh, yeah, eight different ways you can go from each room. You can also go up and down. So I guess there are ten different different routes you can take from each room. It's pretty frustrating to navigate uh, as a gamer, but uh, as a writer, I've always really admired this kind of playful use of the ambiguities of language to disorient the player. There's an English professor and a scholar named Dennis Jurors who's done some great and really important research into Colossal Cave Adventure. And you should read this essay that he wrote um, with Dave Thomas called Cave Gave Game, Subterranean Spaces Video Game Place. That's your homework assignment. You need to read this essay. <laughs> also in Colossal Cave Adventure is a, a different maze, a slightly different maze, a maze of twisty little passages all alike. So because these passages are all alike, uh, they, they, the text isn't different. It's always the same description of every room. And in order to navigate this maze, you have to leave things behind, drop things from your inventory that you've collected, kind of as breadcrumbs. Um, but you have to kind of be strategic about what you drop because there's a pirate in the cave and he will steal your treasure. Mm -hmm. treasure time. <coughs> about 10 years after Colossal Cave Adventure in 1986, uh, another group of developers at Nintendo created this game, The Legend of Zelda, which was inspired in part by the project director Shigeru Miyamoto's childhood memories of exploring wild caves around Kyoto. And then from the first moment of the very first level of the first Tomb Raider game, we're following Lara Croft through a snowy cave, I guess into some kind of tomb. Or maybe the cave is a tomb, like I said, you know, uh, indigenous American people bury their dead in caves. Tomb Raider's spiritual successor, the Uncharted series, also spends a lot of time in caves looking for treasure, a route to a lost city, or a place to hide from thousands of bad guys with guns. And in 2016, No Man's Sky ended a cave generating algorithm to make sure you never run out of caves. Mm -hmm. um, here, the caves are carved out not by water seeping through soft rock, but by code tuned to the human attention span. There's always something interesting or useful just around the corner in these caves. This is the first time we actually enter a cave in Kentucky Route Zero. It happens right at the end of Act One. These two characters huddled around the TV set, Conway and Shannon. They've been looking for a way onto uh, the mysterious Route Zero, and they're surprised to find it here on the small farm. They reveal the cave entrance uh, by adjusting an old TV set. The cave was always here, they just had to tune into it. Of course, that's not the first Time to go underground in KRZ. That happens in the first scene, and as soon as the game starts, you're sent down to this basement underneath the gas station.
Uh, the whole game is spent going back and forth between Mammoth Cave and the mundane above ground Kentucky. So we spend a lot of time in caves, even if they don't always look like caves. Here's one of the most explicitly cave-like environments, the Hall of the Mountain King. This is the name of a real chamber in Mammoth Cave, and also an important uh, location in Colossal Cave Adventure. In our game, it's the home of this tragic old English professor and his doomed graduate students whose uh, funding was cut at the university for their research project. So they fled here in the caves to finish their work deep underground. Here's a, an editor view of this environment. Uh, in some ways, it's, it's one of the more kind of rational environments in the game. It's like 3D and things are generally scaled uh, to match reality. There's not as much use of sort of stagecraft techniques like cutouts and stuff in this scene. But it's also a bit of a maze. Uh, for example, you start the game with a truck parked on one side of the mountain, uh, and you crawl up to the top, and then you go down the other side of the mountain, and your truck is waiting for you there to continue on the highway. This is the project they're working on in the Hall of the Mountain King. It's a computer program called Xanadu. Um, Xanadu is itself a simulation of a cave, the same cave that it's installed in. And it also includes some sampled text from Colossal Cave Adventures, so it's kind of a twisted maze of self-reference. Elsewhere in the caves of Kentucky Route Zero is this building, the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces. Conway and Shannon are puzzled when they encounter it. Are they inside or are they outside? You can't see the sky from a cave, but it's a natural environment, so when they step out of the uh, offices of the bureau here and into the cave, are they going outside or are they just stepping into another interior? There's an editor view of the bureau. Um, you can, it looks pretty different because the camera lens setting in my editor is, is um, a lot, it's like a lot closer than, than the one in the game. Um, but you can see some of the cave features. It's kind of weird cave plants growing. There's stalactites at the top of the building. And lots of secrets. There are some crabs, hermit crabs down there on the floor. Those are some of my favorite characters in the game. But, you know, and here's the highway itself, but you don't usually get to see it uh, directly like this. Usually it looks like this. The other type of underground space that we spend a lot of time exploring in Kentucky Red Zero is the mine. Uh, mines, like caves, are very important spaces for a game set in Kentucky. Uh, for over 100 years now, really large energy companies have aggressively mined mostly coal from eastern Kentucky, um, which is eastern Kentucky is part of this mountainous region in the United States called Appalachia. Mining has dominated the local economy and dramatically reshaped the landscape. Uh, in the 1970s, these large energy companies started to prefer this mining technique called mountaintop removal, which is exactly what it sounds like. Mines are not caves. Uh, mines are carved by human hands, whereas caves are carved by water. Mines are a search for something. Uh, miners dig tunnels and push deeper into the earth to find untapped veins of coal. If we explore an old mine like this one, we're retracing the miner's steps, chasing their ghosts. But caves are an exploration of something that's always already there. Here's an editor view of the mine. It's kind of spooky down here because the lights are off right now. The light is kind of localized to the mine cart. Video games are full of mines also, of course. Uh, in Donkey Kong Country, the monkey mines are a site of high risks and high rewards. You can see there, if Donkey Kong dies, his nephew has to take over working for him immediately. He doesn't even get time to mourn his uncle. And he just keeps grabbing bananas. The first few levels in Spelunky are in a mine, which eventually gives way to ice caves and all kinds of other fantastical subterranean environments. Uh, Spelunky's mines are full of life, densely populated, but also full of ghosts. The Spelunker uses his whip to subjugate the local population and take all their stuff. He uses bombs to open new tunnels and free precious minerals from the walls. 
Sometimes he finds an altar like this one, built to a local god and sacrifices native people and animals on it, totally experimentally. He has no idea what's going to happen. Uh, he doesn't even know the significance of the sacrifices. It's not his religion. Spelunky is the video game mine, and maybe at its most people don't know it. <laughs> Mining in Minecraft is mostly an application of labor and time, but it can be dangerous too. Um, pools of lava deep underground start seeping into your carefully excavated tunnels as soon as you expose them. You're also always kind of half hoping to break through into some pre-existing structure like a cave maybe or somebody else's abandoned mine or an underground stronghold. And that's part of the fantasy and the terror of mining in video games anyway, that like the dwarves of Moria, you might delve too greedily and too deep and find yourself passing out of the human scale mine and into the geological scale cave, not as an explorer this time, but as an interloper. So a maze is a machine for getting lost on purpose. Uh, the interiors are usually relatively featureless, so we can just focus on the feeling of lostness, the reason we're there in the first place. Here's the zero again. This is the secret highway that runs through Mammoth Cave in Kentucky Route Zero. You can see it's a circle. But it kind of changes as you drive around it. Um, some things only appear if you're driving clockwise. Some things only appear if you're driving counterclockwise. Some things only appear if you turn around and go backwards at certain moments. Uh, kind of like a ritualistic combination lock. It's really hard to know where you are at any given moment on the zero, and that's by design. This is the zero is a maze, a uh, machine for getting lost on. Meanwhile, on the surface, the roads look like this. This is like basically a hand-traced map of an actual uh, official highway map of Kentucky. Uh, the story in our game, at least at first, has you searching for an address where you're meant to make a delivery of antique furniture. So an early design challenge for us was uh, how to get the player, how to get the sense of being lost on the highway. Um, something that we've experienced personally, being lost at night on American highways. How do we communicate that experience? Well. One model we looked at early on was uh, this game Full Throttle by LucasArts from 1995. Um, this is a, also a game about traveling on the highways. Um, there's the driving interface in this game, the driving mechanic, is this kind of almost third person, over the shoulder, um, almost first person view. And you have to watch out for road signs uh, and other kind of landmarks. So there's like a, a turn off to a different highway. So it really well, uh, really effectively captures the feeling of missing your turn on a highway, which is uh, kind of frustrating, but interesting. Uh, we experimented with a first-person view like this, kind of cockpit view uh, from the truck. There was another iteration of this experiment later where we had a map overlaid on top of the truck seat. You know, instead of watching for highway signs, we kind of navigate a little bit that way. Um, and eventually we decided just to go with the map on its own. We were drawn to the kind of schematic, sketchy look of the, the map by itself, uh, paired with kind of pretty lush, realistic sound design. So, uh, how to get the player lost here? Well, we came up with a few techniques. Um, instead of showing the player their next destination on the map, with like a, you know, an icon or something like that, uh, characters that you encounter in the game just give you sort of vague directions, like turn left at the tree that's always on fire, or take a right just after the artificial limb factory, or uh, turn on the radio and keep driving until you hear something familiar but strange. Some landmarks only appear when you're basically right on top of them. And some roads only appear while you're driving on them. And after playing with this interface for a while, in case you get too familiar, uh, we take you up in the air and put you on the back of a giant bird and spin you around until you feel lost again. In Act 4 of the game, you're traveling by boat on an underground river, the Echo River, which is a real river that runs through the Mammoth Cave. Here you're a passenger, so your agency is limited to a series of binary choices. At each ferry stop that the boat makes, will you stay aboard the ship and talk to the other passengers, or will you go ashore to explore? Here's part of the map made by Pat and Will Crowther. 
in some locations from the game Colossal Cave Adventure kind of highlighted on there. This image was taken from a really fascinating and thorough piece by Dennis Jers, um, who wrote the piece I mentioned before. This one was called Somewhere Nearby is Colossal Cave, Examining Will Crowther's Original Adventure in Code and Kentucky. So uh, Jers specifies in the title that he was talking about the original adventure, because part of the mystique of that game, Colossal Cave Adventure, is that it's been highly edited and remixed and reworked over the years by many different people, most notably a designer named Don Woods. So it's been difficult to disentangle an original uh, from all the modifications that this game went through. And that's a big part of, of um, Dennis Jarrett's important work, uh, research work. But setting aside the kind of historical significance that um, twisty maze of provenance has always been one of my favorite things about Colossal Cave. Uh, I love how it started as data recorded by Pat Crowther in the real name of Cave, and then it was extended and mutated into an adventure game by Will Crowther for his children to play, and then I remixed by a bunch of young programmers and hackers who had themselves probably never set foot in Mammoth Cave, um, but kept kind of pushing at the edges of Colossal Cave, um, pushing it deeper and deeper underground, and populating it with volcanoes and ogres and dwarves and vending machines and magical swords. All right, so here is how to get lost in a cave. First, establish a base camp. Uh, you should light a candle somewhere and don't let it go out. And now here's the hard part, start walking away from the base camp. That's what it's for. It's the thing that you walk away from so you have a direction to go. Um, a lot of people think you need to be alone to get lost. That's not true. You can get even more lost with more people. Uh, resist the urge to use dynamite. If you're a spelunker, you're not a miner. Look for the passages already carved out over thousands of years by water. Um, take the slow way. And finally, draw a map as you go. You can draw it on paper, you can draw it in the margins of a book, on the back of your hand, or on the walls of the cave itself. Alter the map as you need to. The map is not the territory, even if it's drawn on the walls. Thanks. Personally, been no, inside my. inside the cave. I haven't. No, I live really close to it, but I, I haven't been there yet. Why? Yeah. <laughs> Elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tomas has been in the cave, right? Yeah. There's another one in Kentucky that I really like called Lost River Cave. Um, it was also like a, a important Civil War site, and then turned into a, like a garbage dump, and they just filled it up with cars and boats and stuff. And <coughs> later, I had to pull garbage out, and now you can go and be a tourist there. It's pretty cool. There's a club in the cave. It's like a speakeasy in the twenties in the during prohibition. Yeah. Do you have a dream about the cave? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I think um, yeah. I, I think yeah, I think most most dreams kind of have a, a sort of cave like shape to them, right? You know, sort of like a kind of descent. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> This question like a billion times, but I have to uh, also because we have like game design, aspiring game designers. Yeah. Pros and cons, like you totally candid about releasing a game in episodic form. Like what yeah. did you like what did you guys learn after like this like six years of like developing Yeah, game? that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been it's been really good uh, in a lot of ways creatively and it's been very difficult kind of um, financially. But uh, I think creatively it's been really good to help us to um, slow down a bit, you know, and give, uh, give the work room to breathe. And um, 
which is which is important. You know, because stuff takes a different shape after you've you know even like like even with writing. Like if you are if you want to revise a piece of writing, you can't revise it right after you wrote it. You have to give a little bit of space to read that. I think that's been true of a lot of the, the game. Um, and it's kind of given us permission to go a little deeper on some things than we would have otherwise. You know, if we want each episode to kind of stand on its own in some way. Um, there are developments uh, and ways that we've sort of expanded the scope of certain scenes that we w wouldn't have done if we were just trying to get the whole thing done before we got it out the door. So um, that's been really good. But yeah, it's, it's hard to um, it's hard to make a big commitment uh, at the beginning of a you know eight year project or something and then be sort of like be holding to that commitment for a really long time. It's, it's difficult to do that. So. Or? Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, the, so the story of the game, we kind of um, mapped out a really loose plot um, kind of early on, and we've been following that, but have um, tried to give ourselves a lot of room to, for the, the kind of plot to reflect whatever sort of uh, thematic stuff comes up for us as we approach each episode. So we tried to leave like a lot of blank spots um, in, in the plot outline that we made really early on. And our approach usually is, so I'm, I'm the writer on the game, but, um, but we're all kind of doing story design for the game, so our approach is, is to kind of meet and talk through that, and then part of my role is to, um, is to take our conversations and turn them into outlines and story bible kind of stuff, and, and then share them back with the Tomas and Ben, and say, does this match up with our conversations, match up with what you're thinking, and then uh, we all kind of execute from, from those documents, and then I'm writing the, the dialogue. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, like I, I mentioned this great maze in, uh, of Colossal Cave Adventure, this great like sort of textual maze, and uh, writing uh, dialogue in the dialogue in Kentucky Road Zero is this like multiple choice branching classical kind of like um, dialogue system from video games. Uh, it, you know, it is really interesting to look at that stuff spatially sometimes. So uh, for me, with like when I get blocked on writing, um, I, I always try to just like shift the problem into another type of problem. So if I'm writing like a, in the form of a screenplay or something, and I don't know where to go next, I'll try to shift to um, uh, writing a conversation as like a flow chart, like a visual layout, you know, just to like kind of like get out of um, the mode that I'm stuck in. Um, so, so I do end up looking at a lot of these conversations as mazes, you know, and that way just visually they, they look like how, you know, how do I get through them. Um, but that said, I'm also always trying to write in such a way that it feels like the dialogue's always flowing forward and, and you don't um, have the same sense that you do in some video games. You have this sense of like being at a hub and then going out on a spoke and then coming back to a hub. That's a like format that I try to avoid, but, um, but I do end up looking at them spatially like that a lot. At the time just as a matter of, of practice. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Do you see uh, being lost in a cave as a metaphor for game development itself? Wow, interesting. And, and <laughs> if you do, are you afraid of being leaving the cave soon? Am, of, am I afraid of what? Leaving the cave. Leaving the cave. Oh, I don't know if I'll ever leave the cave. <laughs> it's, it's good to leave the cave, right? That's, when you, that's like a sort of epiphany when you leave the cave, right? Um, no, no, no. I, I like being, I mean, I, I think. I like to have a sense of being lost uh, in a creative <laughs> practice, and part of um, part of what I think we're trying to do uh, as a studio, you know, is to like come up with um, come up with projects that allow us to uh, be kind of safely lost for a little while, and to, uh, you know, so, so that that means trying to make sure that we uh, can work on a project and have enough time to kind of make mistakes and wander a little bit. Uh, it also means not being too attached to certain types of outcomes. You know, we try to approach everything as an experiment, which means we don't, all that means for us is that we don't have an attachment to a specific outcome, uh, creative outcome. So, um, you know, try to, uh, yeah, try, try to allow ourselves to be lost. Part of how, like you have to have a, some kind of process 
to um, to catch yourself, you know. So you have to have some kind of process in place to like check back in uh, and and make sure that you don't just go down a wormhole for ten years or a rabbit hole for ten years. I'm watching too much Star Trek. For this. <laughs> so and um, so uh, that having that process and something to fall back on a team or uh, a good publisher or a, just a working practice, um, I think allows you to let yourself get lost. Do you find your most useful checks on whether you're usefully lost are the episodic releases? So handing it out to people and going, do you like this lost us? <laughs> or um, is it more internal? Is it about building base camp, building those like familiar references as a team, or is it, mm -hmm. is it both? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, those are both, those are two things that, that, um, that both help. I mean, mainly for, for us, I will say mainly it's the, it's the team and having good communication between us and be able to check in with each other and what we're working on. Say like, this is what I'm doing, am I, am I going too far, or where am I, or does this make any sense anymore, or something. Um, uh, but yeah, the, that has been one real benefit of, of doing this episodic releases. And so, part of, so we have the episodes of the game, and then we have, it's basically like a 10 episode project, because we also have this like in-between things that are these little spin-off games. Um, where we, uh, and with those we're like a lot less constrained formally and we try to do uh, each of those in between games, we try to do some kind of formal experiments that have different mechanics than the main games. Um, and so yeah, all of those are useful for us to scope something a little smaller, you know, and like have, so that, yeah, so that we can get back to being done sooner and, and not, yeah, so that it won't expand too, too long or something, yeah. Um, in a larger project, if you weren't doing an episodic release, you might have some other kind of milestone process that helped you, um, helped you be done at some point. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks so much for coming out again. Grazie mille e proseguiamo gli incontri uh, la, uh, fra due settimane con Jen NG che viene dalla University of Law, uh, York per parlare di Machinima. Il 15 marzo avremo inoltre il Machinima Film Festival nel video della Milano Digital Week. E niente, grazie per essere venuti e ci vediamo presto. Sempre, penso che la 135 la prossima volta, non so, ci perderemo ancora una volta. Grazie ancora per essere venuti, buonasera.